Good evening and welcome to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner, also known as Wolf. And uh, today with me is my co-host... Moo Shu. Can't get rid of me. <clears throat> Moo Shu. I'm here once again to Moose. help you run this ship. Well, m- mostly because of the Amazing Dumb. Oh, yes. We- he found out about Amazing Dumb and he was like, I got to be on the next episode. As the captain of Amazing Dumb, I feel like I need to make sure... I support and, you know, come out and say, I support you in this endeavor. I think it was very dumb. important. Yeah. If anybody that doesn't know what we're talking about, go to uh, go to the live stream number 74. Um, I've gotten lots of messages about that's kind of taken on a life of its own. It's about a lizard. Okay. Uh, a baby lizard who, who wore a backpack. Just go and go, ch- <laughs> go check it out. It's the amazing. Dumb. It's the amazing dumb. Okay. So folks, th- if you, if you, and if you're not, familiar with that with the with the with the live stream you need to check out the live stream the live stream is like two to three hours long we get lots of people that come into the chat and it is every tuesday and it's a youtube exclusive you can't get it anywhere else yeah i mean it's, it's, it's youtube yeah and it's it's a cool way to check out some behind the scenes stuff you know interact with uh wolf directly or you know at, interact with some of the actual guests guests that come on and actually are actually on the phone you know, it's a cool thing that you know they're they're able to see the chat as well, and they talk to them. And it's, it's been it's pretty cool. Yeah, and uh, last Tuesday we had on it was a it was about the uh, the, the murders of the LBL, and we had a couple of uh, guests on there. One's a little controversial because people believe him, other people don't. And um, we had him, Roger, and we had Nick Valente on there. And then, and then we had Ken Gerhard come on and give his opinion on some stuff that was said, and it was pretty cool, man. It was a pretty righteous time, PRT, pretty righteous time. But anyway, uh, I am involved in many groups. My email address is uh, Josh Turner at prtpodcast dot com. Josh Turner at prtpodcast dot com, and I have a lot of groups that I'm in. Paranormal Roundtable, obviously the main group. Tony's group. Um, I'm paranormal encounters, but give me a second to get back, get that back up and running. It, it, it's there, but it's just, you it's, know, it's, it's been obviously been, uh, neglected forgotten about for a while now. So <laughs> let me, he's got important things to do folks. He plays, uh, uh, call of duty. I've been struggling. It's been a real sweat. Uh, it's been and actual warfare, basically counter strike. You'd have to see there. I mean, <laughs> playing counter strike for <laughs> 25 years. Was it fun? I don't remember that game being fun back uh, when I was young. Yeah. And it's, it's still around. Yeah. I mean, they just basically just retexture it and mm-hmm. update it again. I like age of empires. I'm still an age of empires guy. I don't care what anybody says, but anyways, uh, anyway, you got Nelly's group, paranormal round table, uh, prayer group, which is mine and Nelly's and then paranormal lounge, which is hers. And then Wolf Turner, PRT fan page, um, uh, Phil Stern, Chris Clough. Those guys are always in there. Uh, whisper to a scream, which is with Ryan Tremblay and paranormal trucker, which is John King quad coalition of sciences, which is Nick Valente, North American Dogman Project Region 2, which is D.A. Roberts. Those are the, the groups I'm in. Oh, and, and Dogman Werewolf Discussion. Don't let me forget, which is uh, Della Carter and Phil Stern. Um, and I'm an admin in those groups, and I have time enough to do those groups, and so that's what I do. Uh, now, tonight's show is going to be – it's it, – prepare to be scared, okay? If you like being scared, then you're in the right place. If you're – Kind of like, oh, yeah, I don't know if I want to be scared, G-Scoob, you know, then you might not want to be here for this one because it, it is, it does it deal with some pretty uh, scary subjects. Yeah, this matter. is more of a Stranger Things episode than a Scooby-Doo episode, yeah, I feel like. Yeah, for sure. And so um, this one, like I said, I'm always working on several projects. Tony can attest to that. I'm always doing several of them at a time. Always moving. It's always moving. And so this one came to a conclusion about two weeks ago. I got it all wrapped up and ready to go. And, uh, but you know, there's always stuff in the queue ahead. Uh, So I was eager to put this one on and I really, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to talking about this one. Um, you can interact with me on Instagram. I'm Josh Turner, 940 on Instagram. That's Josh Turner, 940 on Instagram. Uh, my mom told me that I was pretty handsome. So I put some pictures of myself in there, uh, back when my mom was alive. She was like, you're handsome, mijo. Don't, 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 don't listen to those psychiatrists. And I said, sure, mom, I won't. And I never did. And so, <laughs> so uh, Tony, you were at your mom's today. Was she, did she tell you the same thing? You're handsome? Did she tell you that? No, my mom cares about me. So she just told me I was ugly. She didn't send you into the world with lies? No. Yeah. <laughs> she just said it to me straight. She's like, you ugly. You ugly. The world can't hurt me if she hurts me first. <laughs> you ain't got no alibi. <laughs> oh, my God. So, so here's the thing. 
we joke, we laugh, whatever, but what's going to ha- what we're going to talk about tonight is kind of serious and and so it this this did really happen to some people. And I actually know these people, and that's why I went through and I did the investigation. I talked to these people. I've been out to that property about three times. Um, I've driven out there, uh, not recently, but I've driven out there uh, more than once, and I've been I've been to this place, and it's not it's not a place I want to go. And and I'll tell you why. Mainly because I'm I'm afraid of getting some sort of attachment because I do think it's evil, and I think I really think it's haunted. And so that it's not my uh, cup of tea. People are like, hey, why don't you go out and do an investigation at this the murder hotel or the farm where people were hacked? And I was like, I'm good. I'm good. I don't want to go out there. I don't need to go to Fox Hollow Farms, you know. And I mean, we that's why we had Anna Cho on the show. She could she, she could talk about it because I don't want to go out there. I don't want to go to these places and get something on me because that could happen. Yeah, and, I mean, know? there's certain places where there's so many things that linger that anything can just latch on oh yeah and you take it back with you and you know all of a sudden you start thinking your house is haunted mm-hmm. when reality is because of you know this a uh, trip you went to to fox hollow farm or, or, or to some or asylum some, you know, yeah, prison some, you know yeah. we have some, some friends nightmare that, place basically yeah. they we have some paranormal investigator friends that like to go and investigate ghost places and they go and they and, and we've been invited and we're just kind of like respectfully decline we're cool um, this, this story though, it, it's got it all. I mean, they had a, they, it, it ran the gamut, you know, what was going on out there and people will say whatever they want to say about it, but it is, it is a story and it's not really well known. It, it's not as well known as some of the other haunted places out there. Um, from where I'm from, this wasn't from my hometown. This was miles outside of my hometown, but it was within, I think 15 miles, 20 miles, something like that. Uh, and so where this takes place, uh, we'll get started. We're going to get right into it. And it, it's situated by, by what was once a large Creek. The last time I went out there, it's been, uh, probably 10, 10, 12 years ago. And I can't remember exactly what year it was. I went out there, but I went out there and I was with a couple people and the Creek was dried up. Um, you know, I don't know now. I think it's just, I think it's seasonal. Like it'll be full when the, when the San Gabriel river gets filled up and then the Creek will, it'll overflow. Yeah, it depends the on the rain. Yeah. And it is about eight to 10 acres. And actually I did not ask any of the people that this happened to exactly what the acreage is. Um, so I'll give you a little background on it. There, it, there have been just maybe eight to 10 miles up the road from this place. Sightings of demonic black cats that look like standing on two legs um, there have been tons and tons of Bigfoot reports further, further up east from there, about, about I think 12 to I'd probably say 12 miles up the road from there was kind of where they start. There's some Bigfoot encounters that were, that took place in that area. Um, this had some, some, some crazy stuff happening. Uh, and, and what, and I'll, and I'll give you the, like I said, I'll give you the background. There was, a, there was a family that lived there. They were, they were friends with, one of my sister's ex-boyfriend's uh, family, and they had, um, it was not their particular, it was their cousins, their family, whatever. And so I knew them, and I hung out with one of them because he was closer to my age, and this happened to them back in the 80s. I think they moved from there in 1990 or something like that, and um, so that this all happened like in the 80s, and these, these, were, these were kids. And I think there were six or seven boys all together, and there were three girls. It was a huge family. Um, and they had a, a, a regular-sized house, which was like, I think, a four-bedroom. Big. It was a big uh, ranch-style house, but it was, it was wooden. It was very old, but it was well-maintained. And then there was like a single-wide trailer home close to it that, that, that was probably, you know, 50 yards away. Um, and then way back up in there, you could see it up on the hill was this very large um, house. It was a single story house, but it was very large. I think it was like at least five bedrooms. I went inside of it one time. Um, so I have been there and it was quite dilapidated and it was dirty and it was just, you know, there was a lot of nice furniture and stuff in there though. I mean, like it looked like when whoever was living there, they died or they moved and just left everything there. This house was not part of their property. 
Okay, this the the eight to ten acres stopped at a at a little bridge that you had to cross over. That was a pretty sturdy little bridge. It was like a little wooden plank bridge. Um, but whoever built it did a very good job because it was still there. Like I think maybe two thousand twelve. Yeah, so ten years ago when I was out there, it was still functioning. Okay, when I went out there with a couple people. And uh, you could see the house from the bridge. We did not go across the bridge. I did get out and kind of step on it, and it still was a functioning bridge. The creek would overflow, though. If it rained pretty heavy, it it wouldn't take much. That would be flooded out. And if you're on top of the hill, you're just there. You're stuck. Um, that house is no, it was known to be be haunted by the by the people from that area that lived in the farms and ranches in that area, and um. I'll be real honest with you. Like I wouldn't go out there to to now. I wouldn't go out there. I just wouldn't. I got a really creepy feeling being out there. Uh, The trailer house is no longer there. That's one thing that's not there. The other, and the house that this family lived in is now dilapidated and falling apart. And just, you just, you wouldn't want to go inside of it because something could happen. Would you go in before you had that experience when you were 15, before you really, before I saw the dog man? Yeah. Like were you, you were super exposed into it. Would, would you, Probably if I was a kid and I had someone mm. to go with me. And yeah. I know what you're saying because you know that I was asked. Well, also, uh, but I was I thinking. I know why you're like, asking that. I was also thinking like, you know, like you now with everything you know, like sometimes I, 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 I you might see a situation and be like, I don't want to risk it because of everything you know. You know, all mm-hmm. the possibilities and all the things that might happen if you just take this one chance. Like go str- uh, running in the woods for some reason. It's not worth it because you don't know what's running out there. Yeah. Or going swimming all the time with sharks. It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. Like you, you definitely outweigh it. But as a kid, I feel like you have some of that freedom mm-hmm. of just like. Yeah, because prior to. to I, and, and like I've told people before, I lived in a haunted house. And you know that, Tony. Yeah. And you've actually talked to family members about it. But it, it, it didn't really affect me. Like I've, I've always said, it was more like toward the females. Um, but I didn't. Um, I wasn't like terrified, you know what I mean? Like to go into places that were supposedly haunted. There were only a few, I would feel creepy feelings like something was there because I've always felt like uh, the presence when something was there, but it wasn't like any one particular place. Like if somebody said, oh, that place is haunted, I'm not going to go run away from it. But after being 15 and then later on what happened to me when I was 18, then as time went on, then living in a house, like, no, heck no, I will not go in there. But yeah, maybe before. When I was little, yeah, I probably would have. Especially if someone went with you. Because I did go yeah. when I was little. Now, I had three people with me. So there were four of us walking around in the house. And I think at that time I was 12. Um, but I, 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 w- I went there with a group of friends. There was five of us. And we went. I went there with my friends, there, a few guys that I knew from Thorndale. And uh, we pulled right up to the house. to the, And we went to the bridge. And we, I just, I didn't want to get out and go any further. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, I think I was, uh, you know what? I was 17, I think at that time. Well, I also, think I was 17 at that time. Also, when, you, when you're with your friends, things get kind of, you know, hyped up a little bit sure. over, you know. So it's definitely a lot scarier, especially if, you know, someone dares you to go by yourself. All of a sudden you're like, mm-hmm. every sound is going to sound terrifying. It's well, like. I was offered $20 yeah. you know, by my friend Brad, I mean, I was, and I was like, him and him and Jake were like, I'll give you 20 bucks. I'm like, I'm not going to do it. And, it, and and they wanted me to walk through the front door and go through the back and then come out the side where they could see that I went all the way through the house and then walk back out to the car. And I told them no. And then my friend's girlfriend started telling him, well, why don't you do it? And he's like, I'm not going to do that. So nobody would do it. And I was like, well, I'm not going to do it. And I wasn't even going to cross that bridge because according to the the stories, if you cross that bridge, that's when it gets really bad because the house on the hill was owned by some, by different people than the family I was talking about. The family owned the four bedroom house at the bottom of the hill, along with the trailer house. They did not own the house on the top of the hill. That was like a three or four acre property that had like a weird like fence around it and and like um it was separated yeah it was of. separated and there there were in the time that they lived in that area they said they lived there almost 10 years you know i, th- I think they lived there 9 years and they said that that house at least 20 30 families had come and gone come and gone come and gone and it sat vacant oftentimes 
and it would fully furnish, but nobody, they would always just leave, you know, in the middle of whatever. And there, there were multiple times, like, I think they said that there was like the longest period it went without an, uh, an occupant was like a year and a half. So, and that was when a, actually a lot of stuff happened. And I believe it was in the summer of 86 when a, that a, uh, one of the most terrifying incidents happened, but I'll tell you what happened. I went out there later on, like I said, with a couple people. And was my friend and his, I guess, date. I don't want to say it was his girlfriend because it wasn't really his girlfriend. And we went up to the bridge and we didn't cross it because it didn't look safe. And I was like, you know, and I was not going to go inside because when I went out there when I was a teenager, I was, I think I was 17. Um, the house had already, the whole property had been vacant for a couple of years. There was nobody living in those places. Uh, there was a family that moved into my to my friend's family's house uh, briefly. And then they moved out because of the house on the hill and they weren't even living in the house on the hill. So what, let me, let me start with this. My friend, Jesse, I ran into him in Taylor. I, I went to uh, a barbecue joint there in Taylor and uh, boy, it, it's not uh, what it used to be. Uh, but anyway, I went in there and I saw is it Louis Miller. It used to be just world famous barbecue place. Now it's just like a hipster dive or something. I don't know, but I went in there and I saw him and we, we started talking. Now, this was back in 2000, oh gosh, I think 2016. Um, and we started talking about the, the, my, me being on that other show with the dog man stories and all that. And he said, hey man, I heard you were doing a show and you were on some kind of show about werewolves. And I said, yeah, yeah, I've been doing some stuff or whatever. And he, a mutual friend of ours had told him that I was doing that. And this mutual friend was actually dating one of my cousins. And um, so- I started, I'd started going into detail about what I did and the stories and whatever and, and who, you know, like he knew some of the people who had given me some of the stories. So we began to talk about them and he said, man, you ought to do a show about that house on the hill. And I said, well, I think like, it's it, this, the show that I do is, is more dog man based and, and it doesn't really deal with hauntings and things like that. I said, but I am thinking about doing my own show at some point or maybe writing a book, you know. And he goes, well, yeah, he goes, you definitely ought to do that. And so I, and you know, and I'm always one to pick up and ask people about their encounters. And so I did. And I asked Jesse, I said, I said, did you ever have anything happen to you? Because those were his cousins. Yeah. And he said, he goes, when we were little, he goes, there was a, a, a couple of things that, that really scared the crap out of me. He goes, one, when I was little, he goes, I, I don't even remember it. I blocked that in my mind. He goes, but I remember one time and we'll start with his, his story when he was a kid, they were popping fireworks and he said that. They were shooting bottle rockets and one of the bottle rockets went up and just like, you know how it's supposed to go way up into the air and explode. He said it just kind of went up and it stopped and just kind of shook back and forth and then blew up and everybody had to run backwards, you know, because it was just like right there about how six far? feet up, like, off, yeah, six feet. He said, six feet. he said about six to eight feet off the, off the ground. You know, he lifted his arm up to show me. And I said, oh, wow, that's weird. And he goes, yeah. He goes, it was really weird. And he goes, it was still daylight, you know. And so we were we were actually, we got real scared and nobody wanted to to do anything. And so we all kind of went inside and, <laughs> and everybody was like, dang, all the kids are inside. They're scared to go outside. So the adults went out there and then they continued to pop fireworks and everything went off without a hitch. But he said years later, and I think he said this was back in 2010. In fact, I know he did. He said he went in there to that old house the the one on the hill because the the people who used to own it or whatever eventually sold the property and the new owners were friends of Jesse's and they had bought the property and they were just going to level the house and they said there's some nice furniture in there if you want to take something and there was a there was a armoire and a couple other I mean cuz I've been in there like I said and there are there was some decent looking furniture so Jesse said he went in there and he said, dude, I wasn't in there, but a few minutes he goes, and then I, I was, you know, I was with my girlfriend and my friend, his friend who came to help him, um, actually had injured his ankle. So he was not, um, going to be able to help him. So he goes, well, you know, he goes, I don't know, you know, it was kind of a messed up situation. I know the guy he's talking about, <laughs> he goes to pick him up and he's like, well, I can't do anything. My ankles hurt. And he's like. So why don't you tell me this before I came to get you? Make plans, yeah. yeah. He goes, well, let's go out there. Let me just take a look. You know, and he goes, okay. So his friend, uh, and I don't want to put the guy on the spot because I went to school with this guy, but I know he's kind of a goof. And so he he didn't tell him that his ankle was messed up until, like I said. So he said, well, we'll drive out there. And he he said when he got out there, 
he thought that him and his girlfriend would, because his friend could barely walk. He was like, "We'll we'll go and we'll look and see what's out there, and then I'll try to get someone else to help. scope it out. See what yeah, they to want. scope it out. Well, when they get there, his girlfriend is like, "I'm not going in that place." She's like, I can, I'm just not going in there. And she's one of those people that is like me. She's attuned to stuff. And so he, he said, he goes, dude, I couldn't get her to go. And I know her too. Um, she grew up in a town adjacent to mine, but you know, she, she didn't want to get out of the, of the car. And so he goes, well, I'm going to go ahead and go on in, you know, whatever. And he says, I'm in there. And he said, the most terrifying thing that's ever happened to me in my entire life, dude. He's like, dude, I'm, you're not going to believe this. And this guy's in there holding a bag of, you know, brisket sandwiches in her telling me this, you know. And uh, I knew it was something serious when he put the bag down. I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> if, you're putting your, if you're putting your brisket sandwiches down to tell me in Taylor, Texas, this has got to be something scary. He put it, and he says, let me tell you something, Wolf. This is what they call me. Uh, he said, dude, I was in there, and I walked through the back. He goes, and I thought I heard somebody clear their throat. Like, uh-oh, you know. And he goes, and I'm like, Hello. Hello, and he goes, and I'm thinking, nobody lives here. Maybe there's somebody squatting here, but it's so far out in the country, away from any civilization, you know, that he was like, dude, there, you know, this person could be dangerous, could be a prowler that lives, you know, it's, it's dangerous, you know. And he says, look, I'm just here to pick something up. And then he says, as he turned the corner, there was this uh, china cabinet that was kind of off away from the wall. And he said he saw something kind of gl- like it looked like gold or something kind of glinting like behind the sh- the the china cabinet off of the because it says daylight it was still daylight it wasn't dark yet and he said he goes I wonder what that is so he kind of looked in and he kind of squeezed in behind the china cabinet to try to to reach to grab it and he said it looked like an elongated spoon looking thing but as he went to grab it he's like it that, it wasn't anything it was just like a a, scr- a back scratcher looking deal. And he was like, what the heck is that? And so then he's like, that's weird. Why did it look? And then he says, right when he's like, I'm halfway through this thought. And this China cabinet slides up against me, pinning me sideways with my face up against the, the, uh, face and, you know, into the, to the, into the room away from the, the window and the door. And he said that I was like flattened out and he stuck his arms out long ways to show me. And, and he was smushed behind the, the China cabinet. And he says, dude, it was a long time before somebody finally, you know, came in the door and was like, check on me. He's like, I'm thinking my girlfriend was, so he's like, I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. He goes, this isn't crushing me. I asked him, I was like, is it, I was like, was it pushing on your chest where you couldn't breathe? Was it crushing you? He said, no, it wasn't crushing me. He's like, but I, I couldn't, I was trapped. I couldn't move. And he goes, and I'm thinking, dude, what in the heck just happened? He goes, one, th- one minute I'm, I'm reaching for this golden thing. And next thing you know, this China cabinet's crushing, you know, trying to push me into the wall. And, uh, and he said that he goes, he could breathe and everything, but he said that every time he would try to wiggle or move, it would go, it would get a little tighter. And he said that he was there yelling and screaming. He goes, it had to have been at least 10 minutes. He goes, and he goes, you figured about 10, 15 minutes in, maybe your girlfriend's going to go, okay, I'm now I'm wondering what's going on. It's going to come in there. He goes, but it took every bit of, you know, and eventually he, she opened the door and she's like, Jesse, Jesse. And he's like, I'm back here behind this China cabinet. And so then when he said that, the China cabinet loosened up and then he just walked out from behind it. And so she was like, what were you doing back there? He goes, something pushed it up against me. And she's like, okay. So she goes over there, kind of touches it, messes with it and says, okay, let's get out of here. And they, and they walked out and, um, she told him. She's like, oh, you must be imagining things. She's like, it, it just looked like you walked out from behind the china cabinet. Once they, and he was like, man, you know, she's the one that believes in all this stuff. And she's acting like, you know, like I'm crazy. So when they get out to the main road, she's like, okay, I didn't want to say anything while we were on the property. She goes, but I felt like that spirit was trying to deceive me to make me think that you were crazy. And he was like, really? He's like, cause I was worried that you weren't going to believe me. She goes, no, I really did. She goes, I, she goes, I was terrified to go in there. And she goes, you don't know how long I stood at the door, at the, at the, at the door. And, and, you know, it was a screen door. And she's like, and I didn't see you. And I kept yelling, Jesse and his friend, the one that we, that we went to school with that was out in the, the car. He didn't, he didn't say anything. I mean, I mean, uh, he didn't go with her up to, up to the door with her, but he was right there in the, in the yard. And he didn't say anything, but he heard her yelling. And so he, he, she, he goes, you were yelling at the door. And he goes, she goes, yeah. She goes, I was like, Jesse, Jesse. And he goes, I didn't hear a thing. I mean, he was yelling. And he, and he goes, he but I was for yelling help. for help. And he, you didn't hear me. And she goes, no. 
So he was there screaming. Now, granted, his face was facing inward, okay? But still, you should have been able to hear, you know, he said it wasn't, the front door wasn't that far away. So she should have been able to hear him yelling and he should have been able to hear I mean, her yelling, but there was no it's sound. Not like it's in, you know, middle of downtown. It's in the middle of nowhere. nowhere. No noises. Literally, nothing. Nothing there. I mean, I'm sure you could drop a needle and hear it on the other side. Yeah. So it, it, that's definitely unusual to not be able to hear unless there's some hidden pocket behind this mm-hmm. cabinet that just, you know, is a perfect recording booth. So, you know, that was just a weird story. Um, so that's the latest of, of any story that I've gotten from that place. And and by this point, I don't I don't even know if it's still there. Well, I I'm definitely going you know, out there recently. Intrigued, definitely, because you know that's definitely seems like some Indiana Jones type thing. <laughs> Indiana Jones lured lured him with some fake gold. And then, yeah, that's the weird thing. He said it was something that was shiny, you know, yeah. and curiosity something killed that the would cat, catch you know? your eye. Yeah, yeah. but. Uh, yeah. So anyway, he goes, you ought to do a, sh- a show about that, you know? And I said, you know what? I, you know, that's a good idea. I'm going to do some research on it. And so over the years, I did do a little bit more research on it. The first thing I ever heard about this house, I think I was probably, like I said, about 11 or 12. And there were four brothers in particular that I knew pretty well. I'm going to give, um, these aren't, these are aliases, but I'm going to give give names. One's Philip, one's Carlos. Those are the two youngest. And then there's Bobby and Manuel. Um, and they're the main ones that had, and Richard is one of the older ones, but those are the only ones that I really talked to or dealt with, you know, on, on a regular basis. Uh, I'll say Philip was, was about a year or two, about a year and a half older than me. And I grew up hanging out with him. And, um, so he always talked about this house being haunted. And I remember one day when I was 16 years old, it was Halloween when I was 16, it was the, it was the, the one year anniversary of me seeing that dog, man. And we started talking about ghosts and ghost stories at a little bonfire out there in Thrall. You know where Thrall's at. And um, kind, of, kind of where Paige and them live. Paige yeah, and Richard. I, mean, Richard. Yeah. I, I think you showed me that area. I don't, I don't yeah. know if I've actually like been in there. Yeah, but you've been to Paige and Richard's house. Yeah. So it's like right when we popped fireworks, I think, that one year. It's right down the street, da- like down that road. That's that's where this was at. Okay, so it's literally just like a stone's throw away pretty mm-hmm. much. Yeah, and so – what what happened was, <clears throat> I guess I was eleven or twelve, um, and and so the, the first I ever heard about it was you know th- this you know, and so we were at a bonfire, and they said well you know we can go to that house it's not that far away you know, and and so I had heard about it once before when I was a kid from my sister's boyfriend and, and we were we were talking about it but this this particular party you know it, it was it was like I think I was sixteen. And so we were all like, okay, let's go, let's go. And then it never materialized. Like everybody just kind of played around and we didn't go. So the 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 guy in question, Philip, he started talking about the house. And before you know it, there's about 20, 30 people standing around and he's telling these ghost stories about this place. So I actually caught up with him not too long ago. A few months ago, I got in touch with him, I think back in the uh, late winter, early spring. And I said, hey – how how about we do a story, you know, let's do something on this house, you know? Um, and I told him, you know, I said, a few years ago, I ran into your cousin and he told me the horrific story, but he goes, oh yeah, about the, the, the cabinet or whatever. And I said, yeah, he knew about it. And he said, yeah, I could do that. And I said, can I, can you get in touch with your brothers? Because they're not on my Facebook. And so maybe we can talk or whatever. So I got together. Eventually I, I talked to all, all four of them. Um, didn't talk to to Richard. I want to talk to Richard too, but he's been ill. So I actually did talk to them and I got a bevy of stories from them about the stuff that went on in this house. Not, not just in the house that they lived in, but the house on the Han, on the hill. I say house on the haunted hill because that's what it looks like. But he, but they said that this house on the hill, people, like I said, would come and go. And whenever it sat vacant, there was a lot of weird stuff that happened there. Um, one of the one of the weirdest things was it was a, a couple that had moved out there, and they were kind of these beatnik hippie people, and they made these little weird corn stalk or, or corn husk uh, dolls. <laughs> and he said that when they when they moved out, they left like in the middle of the night, and when they went there to the house, there were like these little corn husk dolls like all over the place. And he like said it was dolls, yeah, kinda, like little voodoo no. looking dolls. And he said that there was like this. Weird, um, like there was a car that was broken down 
And it was like an old 1950s looking car. And I, I did see that. I went to, when I went out there when I was like 12, I saw that, that car. Uh, and I did go into the house, uh, like I said, when I was little, because I was with my, my sister's boyfriend's, uh, friend, his family, some other people that were there. And, uh, and the, like his cousins lived there. So we were, we were, we went walking through the house, but I wasn't afraid because I had a bunch of people with me. Um, but you, I would, like I said, I wouldn't go now. And the thing that was really disturbing was a lot of these things centered around the children. I mean, they were kids when all this happened. I think, uh, Philip was like, when, when, when this was going on in the eighties, he was a year and a half older than me. So he would have been like 12 or 13, maybe, um, you know, when we at, at the height of it toward the beginning of it, he would have been like, you know, maybe six or seven. He was real little. And so he said, we'll start with him. He said, one of the, the, the things that really scared him was every now and then on the, on Saturday mornings, like clockwork, his mother would wake up. Okay. And she would go to, to at that time, the, the local grocery, the closest grocery store was Taylor was at HEB. And so she would go every, like every Saturday, you know, Saturday morning. And he said, it was like luck of the draw. If you woke up in time, you know, he goes, and you could go with the, you know, but he said more often than not, you know, maybe three or four of the kids would pile into the car. And then the other three or four kids that were, that were there would, you know, because some of these kids were already teenagers and they had their own lives and they weren't there. So it was all, it was the younger kids. And he said that, you know, we'd pile into the car and my mom would let us all go. Cause back then, you know, in the eighties, we didn't have to wear seat belts in the back seat. And we didn't, we, you know, we, even as a little kid, you'd stand up in the seat you know, stuff well, you would never imagine going on now. But back then, it was different. Even when I was a kid, my uh, Leo's stepdad would put a bed in the back mm -hmm. of his truck, and we'd all just be laying, like three little kids just laying in the back of mm -hmm. his truck. So, I mean, I can't. Yeah, and, and we used you to might do that all the time. You don't now. see that now. You might see it, but it will be like something very illegal. Very illegal and rare. Yeah. yeah. And so it, it, he, he said, you know, luck of the draw. So he woke up one Saturday morning and there usually was at least one or two kids left behind. And then he'd be like, oh man. And he hated missing grocery day because, uh, you know, his mother, you know, if you were one of the kids that went, you might get some candy. You might get a pack of baseball cards, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. You, you might know? be able to guilt her into getting something you wanted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he said, you know, I, I, I missed the boat. So he goes, I wake up and I go, I walk around the house and there's nobody home. Nobody. I'm all by myself. There's not one person in the house and I'm going, oh my gosh. Now he said he was real little. This was the, the first summer that they lived in the house. And he said it was hot and they hadn't got an AC put in yet. Like they had just moved in. They only been there for a couple months. And he said that they, they were, they had one AC and that was in the mom and dad's room through the window. And so he said that they had like, a, and, and you could see the way it was built. Like it had a wraparound porch. You know, so there was like, it wasn't, it was cooler. Like it was built to be cooler. Like when you open certain doors and stuff. Yeah, the cross breeze or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, so the doors were open. Just the screen, they had screen doors on the front and back. Right. And he said that he, he was in his bedroom and, uh, he was sitting there watching cartoons, you know, trying not to be nervous, but he'd already been scared because he saw like the shadow thing walking through the hallway one night. So he goes, he goes, it just, all I saw was like a shadow and I thought it was my, my older brother, Richard. And so I yelled out to him. He didn't answer. So then he said, he goes, I knew it wasn't my dad because it, it was too tall, you know, but it, he goes, I thought maybe it was Richard. Richard was, at that time was a little bit taller than his dad. And he said, but he didn't answer. And then so, so I got up and I went to look and I see this thing move down the hallway and then, then sink into the wall. So he goes, at that point, he goes, I was terrified. I was like, I'm not, I don't not feeling being alone in this house. He says, so he hears what he thinks is the car pull up. And then he hears the door open. So he gets up and goes and runs to the living room and he, th he starts to look at the clock and he says, whoa, wait a minute. It's only 10 a.m. He goes, my mom leaves at 9 a.m. Like always 9 a.m., you know, and he's like, and it takes till about noon for they come home. And a lot of times she's like, they'll, they would stop and eat some lunch or something, you know, and he goes, he goes, it's only 10 o'clock. Especially if she has the full house. Yeah. She had all the kids with her. And so he, he was like, uh oh. So he knew something was wrong and he sees uh what looks like a man standing in the in the living room and kind of looking side to side. He said he had his arms out in front of him and he was kind of hunched over. And he said he goes, "Dude, I'm like, well, who is that?" And he goes, "And in the face, he looked like Freddy Krueger." This is what he told me. 
Okay, so he's like, dude, I bolt back into the bedroom. He goes, and I go and I and I hide in the pile of stuffed animals. <laughs> he said at that time he shared a room with the two girls who were the, the youngest. They were the young, and he was the third to the youngest. And it was him and his older brother. Um, and they they had this really big bedroom, and they the the two girls stayed on one side in in in, in a bed, and he stayed on the other side in the bed. And they said that he jumped into the. They had like literally a huge pile of uh, stuffed animals. Feast, yeah. So he goes, I hid in there and I could see looking out of this pile of stuffed animals. And he says, this guy, you could hear his footsteps. And he said, he comes into the bedroom and he said, this dude looked like, he looked like Freddy Krueger in the face. He's like, but the more I looked at it, it almost looked like a mask. And he's like, I he goes, you started thinking maybe this guy was wearing a mask. Now, this actually was before the the Freddy Krueger movies. Like that's what's weird about it. Now you could say it was a child's imagination, or he had seen um, Friday the or, or what is it called uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. But he said, dude, he started to realize that it was not a mask. It was a burnt. Like the guy's face was burnt. He goes, it was the first time I'd ever seen a person's face and neck just be completely burned, where the flesh looked like it was hanging off. And so he was like, dude, that guy, he, he just looks so weird, you know? And so he goes, for, for a long time, I didn't know what I, what I was looking at, what I had seen. And then later on, of course, he said he, he figured it out. It was a burn victim, you know? But he said the guy was hunched over. And he said the guy looked like he was sniffing the air and his nose looked like it was, was turned sideways and burnt part, part way off, you know? And he said the guy looked just just decrepit, dude. And there was just these black sunken holes where his eyes should have been. And he said he looked over. Oh, this part right here, dude. He looked over where he was sitting in the stuffed animals. And then he said he began to walk, almost running really fast towards him. And he said, so he closed his eyes and he backed up into the, uh, the pile oh, of stuff, you know. And he said, dude, my foot. He's like, my left foot was sticking out at the bottom. And he said, I felt something grab the tips of my toes and squeeze. He goes, and then I saw the stuffed animals moving around in front of me. He goes, and I was deep down in this big pile. He goes, and I used to resent my sisters for having this closet full of stuffed animals. And he goes, at the time, I was so glad. He goes, I'm sitting there and I'm praying. I'm like, God, please, please make this man go away. And he said that the guy just like, sh you know, shuffled out of the room. And then he hears the, the back door open and close. So then he gets up and he looks out the window and he sees this guy hobbling up the hill going toward that house up on the hill. And he thought that guy must live up there, you know? So his, his mom finally comes home and the kids are all running around, whatever. But he said his, his mom finally comes home and she's all like, you know, bringing the groceries in and whatever. And he comes running up and he's like, mom, mom, there was this man. He came in the house and he looked creepy and scary and he had like burnt face and it was gross and blah, blah, blah. And she was all like, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Philip, you're just, you're, you're just watching you know, cartoons. Watching cartoons. And she goes, look, I look on this right there. Mira, you're looking at the TV and you're now you're scared. See, look, there's a witch on TV right there. And he goes, no, mom, no, no. I saw this man. So when the dad comes home, like like later that evening, he was working, and uh, his dad said, "Well, let's go up to the, to the house on the hill." So him and four of the boys went up to the house on the hill. They go through the house. They don't see anything. They don't. There's nothing. I mean, they looked all through the house. He said there was a lot of neat stuff in there. But his dad, when they were walking out, he says, "Don't y'all ever, ever go in that house because in case there is somebody running around out here, you know, you could be hurt." So he says, "You know, so we didn't do it." But he said that every now and then. You know, little friends come over, cousins and stuff, and they go, let's go play at the house on the hill. And they'd run around inside of there and play hide and seek. Well, one day when he was about eight years old, he said that they, they were doing that and the house was vacant at that time. One of the many tenants that had lived there had been moved out, had moved out. And he said they went in there to play hide and seek. And he said that when they were playing hide and seek, he was laying under a blanket, under a bed. And he said that something lifted the blanket up off of him. And the blanket was literally being held by an invisible something. Like something was down there on the floor looking at him, but he couldn't see what it was. And he said he even felt breath. And then the, the blanket dropped. And so he just laid there and eventually he got up and he ran out. And then he real that when by the time he ran out into the house, all the kids were gone. 
And he goes, I couldn't have been in there more than like a minute, minute, two minutes, whatever. He goes, I came out, all the kids are gone. And so I run back down the, the, the hill, cross the bridge and go, you know, to my house and there's nobody. I mean, like nobody there. They, they were all on the other side of the house and they were playing. Everybody was in the front part of the house, you know, on the front. And he, he came through the back and he was like, where's everybody at? And they were like, where were you? And, and like, literally they were telling him that they had looked for him and they couldn't find him. So they, all the kids just kind of gave up and they figured he had gotten distracted or he had gone down to the Creek and was looking for, you know, crawdads, whatever. It's crazy because he said that two hours had passed. So that was another crazy story that he told me. Um, you know, you got all these weird things happening. You got this weird guy that comes into, into his house where he lives, you know. And then one night, Carlos, he was just a little bit older than Philip. Um, uh, and he, he claimed that one night when he was sitting by in, in, in his bed, sitting by the window, looking out the window, he said it was a full moon. He'll never forget it was a full moon. And he said, I was laying there in the window and I was just looking out and trying to go to sleep, you know. And he goes, it was like uh, back to school. You know, we had, it, he's like it was the first two or three weeks back to school or whatever. And he remembers it was starting to get cool. Because back then, you know, you go to school after Labor Day. So this would have been already close to getting to October. Probably get the first cool front end, you know. Yeah. And so I kind of estimated when this was. And he said that, that he was sitting there and he heard sh- 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 like walking through the grass. And he says, I look and I see this creature who must have been about seven feet tall, dude. And he goes, and he walks right by the window. He goes, and it had a snout like a, like a wolf. And he's like, and I'm looking at this creature and I'm thinking, holy smokes, what is that? And he goes, and then he goes, Bobby, they, they had to share a bed because there, there were so many kids. And he said, I, I, go, I lean over to try to push Bobby to, to, you know, look at this thing out here out the window, you know. And uh, he said that when he did, the thing turned and looked in his direction. And he said that he saw red eyes. And he said that it's all it, it, at one point when it would go through the, 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 there was like a bush right there. And he said it went through the bush and came back out. All he saw was the red eyes. And then it got close to the window. And he said it walked right up to the window and was staring in at him. And he said that it, it looked like a werewolf. And he's like, I just laid there frozen and I thought, is this thing going to come through the window and grab me and take me, you know? Um, and it didn't. It just turned and it walked away. And he said, I watched it walk away. And he said that he was never so relieved in his life. He's like, I was like, dude, I was just, because I was literally holding my breath. And so I closed the window and then I went around into my into my brother's and sister's rooms, closing all their windows he goes, and then my dad comes in the room with a belt, you know, and starts threatening me because I'm closing all the windows. And he's like, hey, you know, why are you closing all the windows, dude? We're it's all going to burn. It's hot as heck yeah. out here, you know. And he, and he goes, well, I saw this creature, you know. And he said when his, his dad had to have known about it because his dad was like, was it real tall and it looked like a wolf? And he said, yeah. And he goes, okay. Well, he goes, well, you were just dreaming. Go back to sleep. He goes, <laughs> you know, he goes my dad just told me it was real tall and looked like a wolf. And he goes, he's like, I, you know, he, he knew. He wasn't stupid. He knew that his dad had to have seen it. So the next day, um, he asked his dad, you know, at the at the breakfast table when they woke up, he said, did you see, if you see he's like, we're not talking about this. You're going to scare your brothers and sisters. And he goes, okay, fine. So he just left it alone, and then they never talked about it again. But I'll tell you this. One night, the boys woke up, and I, it was, uh, it was uh, Bobby – and Carlos and Philip and Philip was little, like I said, and he was scared. So he had he asked uh, the older brother, uh, Bobby, to, to sleep in the room with him and Carlos. Um, and so he he told him he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm scared. Whatever, can you sleep in our bed with him? So Bobby had a habit of sleeping in there for a couple of hours until they went to sleep, and then he'd get up and leave and go to his room. And he said they were all in there, and he said Bobby. He woke him up by like jerking his leg around, like he was like kicking his leg or something. I mean, not Bobby, uh, uh, his his brother Carlos. This was Philip telling me this, and he said that that he woke him up, and he said he goes, "We all wake up, you know." And and Bobby's like, like, whoa, you know, what's going on? Like he woke up real startled, and he said, "Dude, we could see our breath, like the br- our br- it was, the room was cold," and he said, "At the foot of the bed was this 
creature. He goes, but you couldn't make out like any specific features, dude. And he goes, all you could see was this creature. There was an, a light that his dad had installed right outside. He goes, and the light you could see from the light outside on the pole, you could kind of see into the room. And he said, when this thing would move around, it looked like, uh, like if you squirted like a clear gel, you know, he said, like, it was almost like, like gel, like it would move. He says, nowadays they would, they would say it looked pixelated, but at the time I had nothing to compare it to. He said, it just looked like something like, like a clear, like Like a blurred kind of blurred gelatin or something, you know? Uh, And he said, but but then, yeah, kind of, he did say, I asked him, I said, was it like liquid looking? He goes, kind of, but he goes, he goes, it was kind of pixelated, you know? He goes, that would be what we would say now, you know? He's like, but at the time he thought it was just weird. He said years, you know, later when he watched the Predator movies, he was like, dude, I saw the Predator movies and I was like, this, this, th- it looked kind of like that, but not totally. And so he asked me if I'd ever heard of anything like that. And I said, yeah, it's called cloaking. But he thinks he was looking at some sort of demon, but it was like in the shape of like a large dog or something that was on all fours. He said, you could almost even make out the ears sticking up at the top of the head if it wasn't horns. And he still wasn't real sure. Him and his brothers debated about whether they were ears or horns. So he told me that this thing was just, was breathing, like just breathing really hard. Like it was like that, you know? And he said that this thing started to growl, like letting out a low growl. And he said this growl was so strange because it was almost like a hum that kind of vibrated their, their bodies. And he goes, you could feel it into your body. Well, you know, Tony, we've heard of this. It's called infrasound. And so I thought about all these things and I started explaining to him what, what it was. And he goes, why did it, why was it, why was it there? Why did it do that? I said, I can't answer that, but I know what that sound is, that vibration that, that comes from these creatures. And so he said that it was at the foot of the bed and it scared the crap out of them. So they got up off the bed and all ran in different directions and his brother bonked himself into the closet. and it's just pitch black. Yeah, which is dark, whatever. And at this point, the, the, the sisters all lived in one room. Um, there were three of them in one room, whatever. And it was him and him and his brother in this smaller, there was a smaller little room. It didn't have a door. And uh, so he said, anyway, he goes, we were in this little small room, you know, and we all bonked into each other, you know, and, run, and, and my brother ran into a door and like knocked himself almost completely cold, you know. And uh, he says, this thing, whatever it was, we saw it like move and like go through the wall. And he said that it went like it went outside. And that was that. But uh, yeah, that, that was that was crazy, uh, a weird encounter at the foot of their bed. Um, what I really don't like is a thermal like regulation or whatever that they did, where it, all of a sudden just the temperature dropped so rapidly that they could were able to see their own breath. I'm trying mm-hmm. to figure out, like, like how to, yeah, well, drawing think, energy from the air, maybe. Do you think it was like their thermal energy? Yeah. In, entry was able to like the, the, it just drew all the energy, the heat from the air. Well, consider, when they arrived, then let's consider this story here. Okay, this was from his older brother Manuel. Told me this one um, because and I'll tell you why. Because Philip doesn't even like talking about it because he was a little bitty and he was really terrified. The first year that they were there, toward the end of the summer, a couple of weeks before school started, is what he told me. He said that they were out by the creek and they were throwing rocks, uh, skimming rocks, whatever, and they were trying to reach reach the other side. And there was a place where the creek kind of bulged out and it was kind of kind of wide. And he said they were on one side and uh, something from the woods threw a rock and it 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 skidded across the water and went right up to their feet. So they all looked at each other puzzled and they couldn't see anything. They said that this thing started to walk out of the woods. They could see like that same blurry looking, whatever it was, that liquidy pixelated looking image. And they said it was on, on, on two legs. And then they saw it like starting to wade through the water. And as it moved through the water, it created like a mirror kind of looking, you know, it was like a sheen to it, you know? And he said, as there, it was walking across the water, it was coming toward them and they were just like frozen. And they said, the closer it got to them, the colder it got. Like they felt their, their skin, like it was cold and they they could see their breath. And this was summertime. And this thing, once it was about 10 feet away, they felt like they were compelled to just stand there. And eventually they all just broke, broke loose of this trance or whatever. And they all just began to run back to the house and nothing, it didn't chase them. Not at that point, but that was a, that consider that. Now that's a weird, that's a weird thing. 
And this wasn't the last time that something would throw rocks at them. They were down there with their dad one time fishing and they went closer down toward like they, they walked like a good mile or two down the road, down toward where the, the, the San Gabriel was, was where it shot off from the San Gabriel. And, uh, they were walking down there and something was hurling humongous rocks like out of nowhere with no tree cover. They don't even know where these rocks were coming from. So they, it had to have been being lobbed from like, you know, probably a good while away. Yeah, two, 300 yards away from a tree line. And these were big size rocks, you know, the size of like a person's head, you know? And he said they were, they were just like boosh into the water. And his dad was like, oh heck, you know, we can't, we're not going to get any fish. They're scaring the fish. Ain't nobody going to bite, you know? So they turned around and they walked, they walked back home. And, and so that was, yeah, that was pretty crazy. Now here's another incident that happened. Um, Gosh, there were so many of them, dude. There, there's another one that, that, that let, let's go with this one here. When we're talking about cold or whatever. Uh, his younger sister, Gabrielle, she had some, an incident that, that terrified her. One night she woke up. There were all kinds of weird little things that happened. I never interviewed them, but I, this is a story that they told me. Carlos told me this one. that he woke, They woke up in the middle of the night, and she was just screaming and he was the first one uh, at the door, and then Richie, Richie, his brother, was right behind him. And they see her like with her leg up in the air, and and it just drops, and she, she was on the floor, almost to the door. And they were like, "What happened? What happened?" And his, the the other sister, she was sitting there screaming. They were twins, Gina and Gabriel. And so he said that something grabbed her and pulled her off the bed. It was dragging her. Yeah, and the first thing she felt was like an icy, cold hand. It felt like a like claws re- re- wrap around her ankles, you know. And, of course, like I said, this was back in the 80s, and not everybody had a cell phone, so they didn't think to take pictures, but she had bruises on her ankle. And then it just yanked her off the bed and began to pull her out the door, uh, going toward the door until her screams alerted the brothers, and then, of course, the parents showed up and – they all ran over there and there was, you know, there was just her laying on the floor with her leg up and then her leg came down. And, I, and he said, it's possible that she was having a nightmare. Maybe she fell off the bed and she just kicked her leg up and was holding it there and then let go. Yeah, it's possible. He goes, but it's not probable. That's a really weird thing to do. Yeah, he, even, he said that he didn't think that it was, you know. Even in your worst nightmare, you wouldn't just hold your leg up though. Well, consider this too. Gina, the other, the twin, the other twin had been being harassed and was telling the other sister who was always asleep during these harassments. And Gabrielle says, I don't believe in any of this. I don't believe in this stuff. You know, I think you're just making this up to scare me because Gina, the other sister was kind of the drama queen is, you know, what they said. And they're not identical. They're fraternal. But, um, he, she, she, the, the other sister said, I don't believe that you, I think you're just trying to scare me. And so then that, that night that happened. So, you know, um, Think about that. I mean, and I, th- I think he said they were only like six or seven years old. The girls were at that time. And so he said that it was like a, just a, it was a, just more of this uh, terrifying stuff that, that went on, you know? Um, Something about when you doubt them, they just make it so much worse. Yeah. If, if you tell somebody. If you doubt them in their presence, it makes it so much worse. <laughs> do you think, do you really think that? I believe so. I, I mean, I wouldn't risk it. I mean, would you really risk like going, <laughs> you know, somewhere where it's uh, like definitely, you know, it's haunted and being like, oh, there's no ghosts here. Yeah. As it goes, you'd be like, yo, I can make you feel that there's ghosts here like mm-hmm. very real quick. So especially if it's like it's something traumatic too, you know, like a lot of these places where a lot of trauma has happened and a lot of resentment is in the area. Well. They did some research on the the house on the hill, and they found out that that one of the rooms, a guy had burned him. So this was the story. A guy had fallen asleep smoking. That was the first thing they were told, and that it lit the room on fire, but it didn't destroy the house, and they were able to just, just fix that one room, and then it saved the house. Then they were told another story a couple years later by a neighbor that lived about two miles up the road, and he said, that ain't what happened. He said the woman that used to live there was a witch and that she lit her husband on fire because he hit her. And he, they were like, what? And she goes, yeah, she, she admitted it. Yeah. And he said that she was arrested. And when she, when she had somebody that came and put up the bond or whatever, you know, the money, the bail, she skipped and they never saw her again. 
So nobody knew whatever happened to her. Now, you may think, well, it's just a crazy story that just somebody just uh, somebody just makes that up and says a story, you know, whatever. But th- this is what's weird. They would have nightmares on on regular occasions, and these nightmares would involve like this old crone type woman, and sometimes a man that would be standing behind her or next to her who looked like he'd been burned up. Um, <clears throat> so as time went on, this became more frequent. And Manuel actually had a, a terrifying incident where he woke up, he felt all this pressure on his chest, and you probably know what this is, sleep paralysis, and he couldn't move. All he could move was his eyes. And he looks up, and there's this woman who's basically, she's covered in light white fur, is the way he described it. And her face was weird looking, dude. It looked almost cartoonish, and she had like this weird looking pointy nose. And he goes, dude, she was like, you know, she didn't have clothes on, but he goes, but she was covered in this like real light white hair or fur. And he said she was on his chest and she was breathing like, (sighs) like that. And he looked at her teeth and they were all rotted. And the ones that weren't rotted were pointy. And she was trying to speak, but it said that when she would speak, it was just like some weird garbled, you know, nonsense that he'd never heard. And he didn't even sound like a language. It just sounded like somebody making weird noises. And he said he looked up and just saw these black beady eyes, you know, bulging out of the the face. And he was like, he was just terrified. And she was pushing down on his chest. And so he just screamed and he, he finally was able to move and he threw himself up and she was gone. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, that, that story right there was pretty, uh, it was pretty terrifying. Um, and you wake up and something's on top of you. Yeah, I mean, there's also, and you know, a lot of what's interesting is you'll hear that story throughout, um, all all over. There's a there's quite a bit of stories about like a hag, mm-hmm. you know, that sits on your chest. Yeah. Or uh, I've heard stories of like uh, sometimes like they believe that if a horse was real tired. And you know, real exhausted, even though it had been rested all night, that a hag uh, uh, latched onto it and had it running around all night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, that's a, that's a yeah. And people have, have claimed to have seen like goblin type creatures like on the horses. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's crazy. And then you hear about the fae braiding their hair and doing things like that. They wake up and they're, they're always they're, so mean to horses. Hor- well, I mean, like I said, the, the, the ones about the hair being braided, that's not like they had been brushed. and. Well, I, I heard that they did it like they didn't as a t- like, way to tangle it. Oh, okay. I, I, was, I thought it was something nice they did. So it's no, not. Like, I, it wasn't like they just braided it to look pretty. Like, I think I heard like they braided it to things, right? Yeah. They had to get like the horse stuck to stuff. Well, that, I mean, that would, that would uh, make sense. Um because there was a story about horses and cows. Like there was a pasture just beyond the, the property where the house on the hill was. And there were cows out there. And they, they had an, a, another little area where there was a couple horses at one time. And and so they were out there near the pasture, walking through the pasture. <laughs> uh, his older brother and his uncle, of all things, were trying to catch rattlesnakes. Uh, which ones? This was uh, uh, Man- uh, Philip's older brother, Manuel, mm-hmm. and their uncle. And they were trying to catch rattlesnakes. Because in, in Taylor, you know, there's a rattlesnake yeah, second championship. It's every pretty year. much everywhere around every, here. Yeah, every year, there's a rattlesnake second championship. And Taylor, the state championships, I think is what it is, is there every year. And so I know it's silly, folks, but they try to see how many rattlesnakes they can sack. It's crazy. Um, and one of our clients is actually in the Ginsburg World Records for, you know, all this rattlesnake stuff. He was on a show called Rattlesnake Republic. We People are him, crazy, I mean. but yeah, we call him Snake Man. His name's Robert Ackman. He's a really yeah. um, cool guy. But um, anyway, what's crazy is <clears throat> this this particular incident, they saw the one of the horses just start bucking, like just out of the blue, just started jumping up and down, moving up and down, and the cows were all running in a circle. And it was like something was out there messing with them. And they didn't see anything. But on one other occasion, when they were out there doing that, when they were looking for snakes, they saw, I mean, what could only be described as a very large Sasquatch, like standing near a tree line coming off the San Gabriel River. And it was just standing there at the, at the tree line. And they said that they knew it was a Sasquatch. It said it was about 80 yards away. 
and they could see it clear as day and they were just it was just staring right at them and it said it had like its arms crossed and then it lowered its arms to the side and the arms were down past the knees it was like really long armed kind of ape like but very just quintessential sasquatch looking creature uh brown uh, br- real dark brown and just turned and walked back into the woodland and so yeah that that happened to hit their uncle and, and to Manuel. and i think bobby was with them at that at that time too but uh, yeah, it was just a whole hodgepodge of you know activity basically going on all mm-hmm. around, you know. which makes you wonder like why. Yeah, you know, and, I mean, now that was that was miles away from the house. That was like two or three miles up the road, you know. But still, in the same general vicinity, you know, you're getting all this weird stuff. And like I said, we'll get into some more weird stuff next next week, folks. That's it for tonight. But uh, we still have a lot more. Like I said, we got meat on the bone here. We're going to do this again next week. We're going to finish up talking about, or hopefully, you know, talking about this, uh, all these weird phenomena that went on at this place. Uh, so thank you for, for tuning in. Don't forget to tune in next week and don't forget to hit the light str- live streams and, uh, uh, make sure that you like, and subscribe if you're, if you like us and, and, Think we're doing a good job? Leave a comment. As always, we're going to drop the, the this show, the link to this sh- show from YouTube onto the uh, Paranormal Roundtable group. And if you go and you leave a comment, you could win a prize, an autographed book from one of many uh, famous authors. Or, you know, uh, if you want to go check out the merch store, we have some really cool merchandise. And uh, another reason to check out the live stream is that you might be able to win some merchandise for free sometimes mm-hmm. well, you we do, we do giveaways a lot of time. giveaways all, all the time and speaking of giveaways the when we do the conference next month if you haven't if you haven't heard the 12th and the 13th august 12th and 13th is the Par- paranormal roundtable presents dogman uh cryptid conference your tickets you can be can be purchased at eventbrite under paranormal roundtable presents dogman uh, cryptid conference go and check it out um Tickets are $30. Uh, just go and, and there's going to be a ton of speakers there. Ken Gerhardt, Nick Redfern, Lyle Blackburn, myself, David Weatherly, uh, Lyle, uh, 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 Barton Nunley, just Kenny Irish, a bunch of people. A bunch of people are going to be there. So I think there's 16 speakers all together. Bettina. Yeah, Bettina Moss. I mean, it's just, there's a ton well, of people. I can't name everybody. It's Steve a, Stockton. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. It's, Tony it's, Merkel, it's Josh worth it to come check out. Come check it out. And, and, and so buy your ticket. It's in Paris, Tennessee. Go to Eventbrite, purchase your tickets, and hopefully we'll see you there and we can talk about all kinds of uh, dogman stuff mm-hmm. and, and you can hear the all kinds of- The whole PRT crew were there. Come meet us, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, And we're going to be doing giveaways, door prizes. We're going to do raffles. We're going to give away a bunch of stuff and we're going to sell a bunch of stuff. We're going to have a bunch of uh, merchandise and all kinds of cool stuff. We're going to bring it, okay? All right, folks. Well, that's all for tonight. I'll see you next week. Good night. <laughs>